practitioner support. Good morning, good morning. Can anybody indicate to me whether you can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Okay, we will give it like a few more minutes before we start officially the course. Just to see how many will still join us. Ah, Okay, can I ask Mr. Manda to please mute your microphone? Could you please mute your microphone?
Okay, good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to Environmental Water Management, a course that is um, launched by WaterNet. Oh, I see the Dr. Kujinga is joining us. Um, good morning, Dr. Kujinga. Would you like to say a few words or can we just continue? Uh, good morning, Trudy. Uh, not much, just to welcome the, uh, the participants and um, wish them all the best in this course and uh, to encourage them to keep on following the course on the, on the platform and the other live sessions that will follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, for those few words. Um, yes, from our side, we would like to welcome you, a very big welcome to Environmental Water Management. Um, it's a course that is actually hosted or that was hosted by the University of Malawi. Um, myself, I am from the Namibia University of Science and Technology. We are working with the University of Malawi on this specific course in the development um, of this course now online. Um, yeah, so this is our first trial of an online course. The course, most of the course material has been uploaded to the platform. And that is the source of information. It will also be archived there. So you would be able to access it after the course has been completed. The course is officially starting today and will run until the 19th of, um, oh, sorry, until the 26th of November. This week, we will cover the environmental impact assessment and the strategic environmental assessment um, part of the course. And then next week, environmental flows will be covered, um, yeah, until the end of the course. In short, I hope you have been on the platform. There is a course outline. You will see this in the introductory part. Oh, maybe I must introduce myself first. I'm sorry about that. Um, my name is Trudy Tron Biekas. I'm a lecturer at NAST, as I, see, as I said already, the Namibian University of Science and Technology in Ventuk, Namibia. Um, I'm a chemical engineer by first degree and I specialized in environmental engineering. Um, yeah, I think that in short, I've been more than 20 years in industry, mainly water, wastewater, um, also related to solid waste, etc. But I'm a lecturer in the past three years, initially part-time and full-time for the last two and a half years at NAST. So that's in short. Um, maybe I must ask one or two of you that is brave enough to tell us what do you expect from this online course in environmental water management? Could you share just quickly with me what do you expect from the course? Is there anybody that would like to share what do you expect from this specific course? Yeah, yeah morning, Trudy. Hi. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, so my expectation really is to learn more about the implications of not doing the assessments particularly because I, I've seen, um, you know, even from the presentations on the platform uh, at the moment that it, it's quite critical but I'm just trying to really get a full picture of the real implications, like how far, um, you know, uh, these implications can go if we if we are not really, uh, if we don't do the environmental impact assessments uh, effectively. So I'm, re I'm really keen also on just, um, yeah, meeting guys and, and, and getting a, an opportunity to network even whilst the sessions are ongoing um, and also just to know the extent of, opportunities that are uh, within this field. Yes, thank you very much, Innocent. That's awesome. 
Um, anybody else? Networking opportunities obviously is, is something that we all look forward to. So thank you very much, Innocent, for that. Is there anybody else that would like to share with us what is your expectations, expectations from the course? Yes, yes, Trudy. Um, my name is Ntangani Zeni Padana. Um, I'm currently working as an environmental management intern. Uh, so for me, basically, I want to learn how water is being integrated um, during our environmental impact assessment. So I'm really looking forward to learn that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Padana, is that correct? Padana, did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, 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 Padana. Okay, great. Awesome, thank you very much. Somebody else that would like to say something? Hi, everyone, how are you? Great, thank you. Chilisa. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be here. I'm a student at UKZN. and I'm doing my undergrad degree, completing my, under, my undergrad degree this semester. So I'm looking forward to this course as I will be doing my honors next year. Okay, thank you very much, Chlisa. Anything specifically that you would like us to cover? Uh, just to get some knowledge on how water is being managed yeah that's that's it i can say thank you Julisa. okay i'll give two two more people to uh, an opportunity to say something um is there two more people or two more persons that would like to say something in terms of your expectation for the course Anybody else that would like to share your expectation? Hello, good morning. This is Rowan from Zambia. Good morning, Rowan. Yes. So for me, um, I think I'm more interested in the environmental flow part uh, of the course. And um, I've never really done any practical course apart from one seminar here and there. I would really want to see what is in there in the theories of um, environmental flows and especially how to practically determine them because I think most of the things that I've seen and read, they are more theoretical. So I hope there'll be a little bit of some practical suggestions or examples or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rowan. I will share that expectation, expectation with, uh, with our colleagues. Last person, anybody else that would like to share expectations for the course? Nobody brave enough anymore. Remember networking is, is one of the core opportunities that we have with online. Um, is there anybody else that would like to share your expectation for environmental water management? Nobody, okay. That's great. Um, thank you very much. Oh, there is some, no, I guess somebody. Is there somebody that would like to share still an expectation? Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Samson Muyima from Mozambique. So my expectation for this course is I would like to strengthen my knowledge in the field of environmental water management to know how best we can manage our water in the the dams and for the all environment. So my expectation is that is to strengthen my knowledge in this field, in this field, and also for networking. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Salso. Um, thank you very much for that expectation. Um, yes, so welcome again. 
to uh, environmental water management. As I said, the courses that is currently running is linked to the integrated water resources management masters um, that has been running for many years. Um, NAST is also or had been a host um, for students in the past. And we are actually offering more um, the water management in the wastewater management part. Um, I hope you know that Ventuk is a uh, Namibia is a very dry country. So Bintuk is known for more than 50 years that we directly recycle our wastewater back into the drinking water system. So if you live in Bintuk and if you've ever been to Bintuk, then every three days, you actually drink about 25 to 30% of the water that was used and that went into the wastewater system three days ago. So that's the awesome part about Wintuk. Um, yeah, because we had to, they realized many, many years ago, people settled in Wintuk because of the hot springs that we have. So we have a lot of hot boreholes that the city of Wintuk, which is the municipality, is running. Um, and they settled here, but Namibia is known that we don't have any perennial rivers running inside the country. So we only see our rivers run when we have our rainy season. And so we have some dams that also collect this water. We basically have perennial rivers only on the borders of our country. So we have some rivers that borders with Angola and then also with Zambia and Zimbabwe. And then in the south, we have the Orange River that borders with South Africa. So that is some of the unique things about Namibia in where we're coming from, from an integrated water resources management perspective. So in terms of reusing water and knowing how precious this resource is, um, it is very well known in Bintuk. Um, and people in Bintuk is very sensitive to water use, water demand management, and they pay a lot for the water, water also, I have to say. So, um, yeah, and that's just what is unique about our country and specifically Vintu, because, um, yeah, we don't get a lot of rain and we have very high evaporation rates. So, because um, we mostly desert or semi-desert. And um, so in terms of that, that's why NAST was host, hosting the water treatment, wastewater treatment, because we have a big uh, recycling factory, if you wanted to know, to, to call it like that, but it's actually called the New Horianja Water Reclamation Plant that the city of Ventuk officially um, built and uh, inaugurated and more than 20 years ago already. So, and before that, there was a smaller plant um, that produced between five and 10% of the demand in the city. Um, so this bigger plant has been running already for, for 20 years plus. It's just giving a background in terms of the water side and where we're coming from. And this specific course is actually located or was in the past located with the University of Malawi. So we're just assisting because we're working together on this. Um, to develop the online course. And the part that I will be covering is the EIA part. My colleagues from, or our colleagues from the University of Malawi will take over tomorrow in terms of how we continue. And you will do the case studies, you know, fully the practical side about EIA tomorrow. And then um, Thursday, Somebody again from the University of Malawi will continue on the strategic environmental assessment in next week. Um, prof uh, will continue with, with the environmental flows, which is one of the expectations from that one, one of you, uh, Rowan specifically from Zambia mentioned. So in terms of the online course, there's a course outline. I'm sure you have visited the the platform. So 
if you go onto the platform and you visit the environmental management course, you would see there's an introduction part and then the details is then again given under environmental impact assessment, strategic environmental assessment and environmental flows. So when you click under environmental impact assessment, the first window that opens was, is actually the course outline. And that just gives you in a colorful way um, what is the learning objectives, what is the learning activities, and then also the resources, what you would find on the, on the platform. And um, environmental flows in the second week. I'm just quickly admitting some more people to, to this session. So in short, in terms of environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment, there's, there's just um, notes. We've loaded also the complete notes. So if you go under on the platform under um, uploads, it's under files and uploads, you will find the complete notes. Then the case studies has been loaded on the platform also under case studies with EIA. And then the first video on under EIA is what we will briefly get into this morning. And then, uh, yeah, environmental flows, the fundamentals about the environmental flows will be covered next week. Um, so I just want to ask, first of all, before we start um, the second part about the course outline gives you a little bit more about the EIA section specifically. Um, it will be in the next, covered in the next two days. Um, there's a lot of reading in terms of the notes please do go to your notes because there will be assessments done during the course. Um, yeah, in the different parts is what is in EIA legal and institutional framework, where it's coming from, the steps, the social side, and then the case studies. So that's in short what is covered. Then the second part on the platform, you will see there's a specific video it's just a five, six minutes video. And I, before we continue, I just want to check, did anybody watch that video or did you watch that video already or not yet? Can you just give me a response there? Because the next question I'm gonna ask is related to that specific video. So that's what I'm ask, why I'm asking, have you watched the video or not yet? Yeah, I've watched the video. Should we respond in the chat or, or, or unmute ourselves? Sorry for that, Trudy. Yes, you can. Okay, in terms of rules, you can unmute. I would like to speak to you rather than reading the chat. So please do speak to me. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I did watch the video. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, in that case, I would like to ask... Then the first question is um, related to the ESCO Convention. Can you give me then some explanation about what is the ESCO Convention? Just in short, I would like to have just two or three answers in terms of what is the ESCO Convention? What is it about? Yeah, so from what, um, from what I've got, the ESCO Convention really is, um, is an agreement or a framework uh, that you know that could be employed by different governments um, when they are doing projects that can have an impact on on either side. So I think it what it does is that it lays out or puts out um, a framework which can be followed, uh, you know, in these uh, engagements as as governments are involved in huge projects that can affect. Uh, the water users or the environment of the other of their neighbors. I think that's just what I what I got from it. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Innocent. So it's in a transboundary context. EIA in a transboundary context. Anybody 
else that would like to share with us what is the ESPO convention in your own words? If you haven't watched it, um, you can watch it while we are speaking um, quickly. If, is there anybody else that knows what's the ESPO convention about? Okay. If there's nobody, that's also okay. Um, but Innocent said, uh, summarized it well in terms of it's a general agreement for EIA in a transboundary context. Um, it would be nice for tomorrow morning, we will have a short feedback session as well as um, a quiz before I give over to my colleague to continue with the case study. It would be nice that you have watched the video already by then and that we just give, give some feedback in terms of that. Um, I'd appreciate that. So that's, I will just quickly check in the chat what it, do you honest geothermal energy? Um, question is where? Um, yes, so students, um, to continue, the video gives you a short background about what is the ESCO convention, that's EIA in a transboundary context um, from the UNECE. Um, and then I would like to quickly have a discussion with you again in terms of development of a new dam and development of a motorway. And what is the, the positive and negative impacts that we can just quickly mention just as a practice before we go to the notes in detail or the presentations. And just because I'm not going to go through the presentations in detail or the notes that has been uploaded. I think that's what online online course is about. A lot of the learning actually happens um, not in the in the session. So remember that for the rest of the course, we expect with an online course that you have looked at the material and that the sessions that we have is actually interaction discussion sessions where we, you have looked at the material and maybe you have questions or you have um, found something that you would like to know more about. Um, yeah, that is what we expect from you. So in terms of um, the discussion session, the discussion sessions that is listed there on the platform also. Um, the, a new dam. In the Namibian context, I can refer to Nekertal, which is a dam that was developed in the south very recently, uh, with a new dam and an EIA. Do you think in a full EIA is required for a new dam development? Hello. Yes, good morning. Good morning. This is Francisco from Mozambique. Yes, at least in Mozambique is fully required. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Anybody else? Yeah, I would like to, to concur with Francisco uh, there, Trudy, that um, it, it is a requirement uh, because I, I don't see how you can avoid affecting other other people or your neighbors or whatever the case is. So I, I, am, I think it is required. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody else? I remember this is discussion session. So um, mm -hmm. I would like us to take part as much as we can. Um, discussing this because we will go to the impacts now, positive, negative impacts, and we will do the two. One is a dam, a new dam development, and the second one is a motorway or a highway development, just to, to create a background for the information that is on the system and what EIA is about. So yes, I agree. Full EIA definitely required with any new dam development. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the next yeah, so question is then, uh, yes. Yeah. A, a little bit of a, a contribution. It, um, in the Zambian scenario, I think it depends on the size of the dam. Um, okay. For, for small dams, uh, there is what they call an environmental brief. So that's shorter one. <laughs> I think it's about, oh. um, I can't remember exactly, but I think a, a dam uh, that, that is like a reservoir that covers something like, uh, is it 20 hectares, something like that. Uh, within okay. that is like an environmental brief. Then when it's larger than that, and also a certain height, I can't remember whether it's six meters, three meters, I think, then you do a full EIA, yeah, something like that. I, 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 I don't do them, so <laughs> I can't remember exactly the the, the 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 cutoff point yes yes but in no, general thank you very I agree much for that, that that's and, cool. sorry you, you can continue sorry I yes I was saying in general you. as an individual I agree that we really need a full environmental impact assessment because these are some of the things that have brought us problems correct yes Thank you very much, Rowan. Um, that's an interesting perspective there that Rowan is giving us. And that's the nice thing because we are coming from different countries. And that's why I want us to, to, to network and to discuss and to speak. Um, in Namibia, we don't have that, for instance. We have to do whether it's a small dam or a big dam, you have to do a full EIA. So that's an, an, uh, an interesting site having to do a brief uh, environmental assessment um, instead of a full EIA. In terms of this, um, is there somebody else from a different country that want to share? Yes, yes ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Can you see? You, you may speak. Please do speak. Yeah, I, I will also agree with Rowan from Zambia. I'm Knossi from Botswana. Okay. So for, for some smaller dams, uh, we don't normally do the EIA, but as for, for larger dams, EIA is a, a requirement from our side here. But I will also think even the dams are small, we should, we should be doing EIAs because in future, you find that we have a bit of impacts which were, I would say, neglected when we started the, those projects. So yeah, it's, it's very important to be done, whether it's a, a smaller scale or a larger scale. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would like us to, to discuss, I would like us to speak more. So I would like to have more responses from, from you, please. Uh, Trudy, uh, uh, this is Francisco again. Uh, it's quite the same uh, with other countries. My colleague here says uh, if it's small or not. For Mozambique, for instance, if you have an inundation area of five hectares, mm -hmm. you, you, you are required to do the, the full EIA. And if it's, a, it's, a, it's in a protected area or sensitive area, that will go up up, we have another class, another category of, of environmental impact assessment study, which is A plus category of project. That requires more, it's more, it's more, uh, the requirements for that, it's, it's a bigger one because it's required for another uh, uh, independent uh, advisors to review your environmental yeah. impact assessment beside the government. Yeah, that's uh, mm -hmm. our, our scenario in Mozambique. Great, thank you very much, Francisco. Um, yes, I agree with you. Um, I would like to know from the guys that were saying that um, you, you only require an environmental brief for the smaller dams. Like you mentioned, Francisco, when it's in a sensitive area, um, is it still just the brief that's required um, in terms of um, the size of the dam? 
because there's always impacts when you start to collect the water. It's something, yeah. Um, I think the person from Botswana already mentioned that he thinks they should be in EIA done, yes. Um, so yes, thank you very much for that. Um, I would like us to speak a little bit more. Is there somebody from other countries that would like to share what is happening in your country? Do you need to do a full EIA with a new dam development, whether it's small or big? Okay, hi Trudy. Good morning, Bongani. Hi, good morning. Yes, yes. My name is Bongani from Zimbabwe. Well, Welcome. in my yeah. in, in my experience, we usually do what we call a scoping statement. And the scoping statement informs us of, of whether to do an EIA or just a monitoring or just a mitigation plan. So okay. that's what I've seen being done. And usually it usually starts off with a scoping statement. Great, thank you very much, Pongani. Um, some more countries, please. Let's speak because we're learning from each other. That's the, that's the, the reason for this discussion session. We- uh, Hi, Trudy. Good morning, hi. Good, hi, uh, I'm Eric Chitende from GRC. Democratic Republic of Congo. Welcome, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you very much. So for based on the knowledge you get to know, actually in GRC, we, we are not used to develop a lot of things, but actually with the irrigation that we are, we are working on, we are trying to see in which way we can develop the dams. But based on the general knowledge, I think EIA is required, required because you know, before setting up, even in terms of regulation, they are requiring to, to start with EIA before implementing any project in GRC. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, uh, hello. Good morning. Uh, good morning. I'm Alfred from Kenya. Welcome, know, Alfred. Yeah, uh, my contribution is that uh, I don't know much of how we do it here, but the thing I know is that EIA should be a necessity since there, there could be there is a lot of disturbance from damming for, for ecology that burns fish. Uh, forest lands will have to be cleared. Uh, there is wastelands too. The farmlands will have to be disturbed. To be disturbed, there will yeah. be lots of coastal erosion, and people too will be disturbed when they be relocated for dam. Uh, and there is also the people downstream may also be affected since the damming upstream may affect the flow of water downstream. I think it should be unnecessary. For Yes, thank you very much, Alfred. Any other country or wherever in the... It seems the connection is a bit bad at the moment. Alfred, hey, can you just repeat again the last sentence? Okay, we lost Alfred there in the last sentence. Is this Alfred your last uh, sentence? sentence uh, and there'll be uh, people will be affected since the, yeah. the, 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 the water connecting people downstream will be cut off or it would have reduced in the quantity flowing. And that mm -hmm. will affect a lot of things. Thank you, Alfred. Hey. Somebody else? So, do you want to share with us? Oh, hi. Um, my name is Mama Supasoli. I come from Lesotho. Um, so, in Lesotho, while well, we do have, I think, two major dams that have been constructed, and they're quite big because most of them transport water to the Republic of South Africa. 
So in our case, in the construction of these two particular dams, um, the EI, the environmental impact assessment was not only necessary, but it was a precondition for it to happen so that we're able to assess the cumulative impact over time because the projects are more than 30 years old. So it was important for us to assess what the impacts would be currently, I mean, before the project began a while back and over time, what would happen. Um, one of the greatest challenges though that we did observe as a country was the lack of implementations of some of the recommendations and um, the ramifications have indeed been very dire. But from a more generic approach or view, I do think that environmental impact assessments are very necessary because there are obviously some environmental threats and that such things as biodiversity loss as well as some social economic impact. And these can swing either way, whether they're going to be positive because they're going to be jobs created or negative, mm -hmm. such as people are going to be, need to be displaced. So I think yes. it's, it's imperative because now also, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these, uh, in fact, rather water, let me put it this way, because of the location of some of the water sources, they're very interlaced. So it's important for us to have a holistic view because the distribution of it is very integrated. If one thing goes wrong somewhere, the entire water yeah. system or the hydrology of mm -hmm. the space becomes affected. Thank you very Thank much. You. So that was a good background being given there. Um, anybody else that would like to share from another country, please go ahead. Mitchell. Uh, hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, but there is a background noise. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, Mitchell from Kenya here. Um, uh, in Kenya, uh, EIA is a legal requirement for any project, and usually projects are classified uh, according to anticipated impacts uh, that they would have. So damming, uh, usually is classified as a, as a major project. Uh, and so it is mandatory that uh, they have to go through uh, the EIA process. And recently, Kenya has sort of been moving away from the EIA concept uh, and getting into uh, the ESIA, where now you have to integrate uh, social impacts in your environmental um, assessment. And usually the yeah. process for that is that uh, for any project that for any project undertaking, you start with the with doing a project report, and you submit that to the National Environmental Management Authority. So, and if the authority considers that uh, the project we might have significant impacts on the environment and the and the society in general, you now have to move to a full um, ESA. Uh, uh, stage. Uh, the process for that is that you usually uh, you start with the scoping. Uh, after scoping, you develop uh, terms of reference for 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 the ESIA. So the terms of reference usually determines a majority of what you will incorporate in the in the in the report. So yeah, it's that. Yes, thank you very much, Mitchell. Um, I think I will go to the next two questions now. Uh, we'll discuss positive and negative impacts in terms of the dam development still. Um, can we sh just share, I think we have mentioned a few already, but can we just share what is the positive, what do you think is the positive and negative impacts related to a new dam development? So that's our next questions. Can we just have some responses from the different countries again? Hello, good morning, can you hear me? We can hear you, Moyo. Welcome. Yes, my name is Nomvla Moyo from Zimbabwe. Uh, usually, damming projects have positive impacts. Uh, the main reason why damming becomes necessary is because we want to harness and harvest water. And once water is available, it enables the water dependent uh, projects, which uh, mainly support livelihoods such as fish, fisheries, the aquaculture, 
we have uh, the tourism project where we have people boating and then we it also supports the environmental systems like water availability potable water we can now have a water treatment plant to provide uh, water for the residents and also it also provides water for irrigation projects and water for supporting a uh, sewerage system for wastewater uh, treatment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Moya. You mentioned there is some positive, positive impacts. Somebody else that would like to speak to us? Yes, uh, this is Francisco again. I would like to add more on the positive side before uh, other participants stressed on the negative part. Uh, I, will, I would like to add what my president colleague said about the positive impact. As uh, um, most of you might know that Mozambique is a downstream uh, downstream country. So we have nine large rivers that are international. The big ones are international rivers. So uh, Mozambique is af affected by floods every year, almost every year. Some, some part of Mozambique has some certain level of flood. So what we need most here, what are the main advantage here beside the, the water bank that we can have with dams is to reduce the impact of the flooding. We need more dams than never now to reduce the impact of flooding, especially in, in the main cities of central of Mozambique. Yeah, that's a, one of the positive impact I would like to add to the uh, previous ones. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Francisco. There is a very good uh, perspective from a totally different side. Um, yes, that the dam could actually reduce the impact of floods. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else that would like to share on the positive or negative impacts of a new dam development? Um, I think I alluded earlier to the concept of job creation, um, obviously from the inception phase all the way throughout because that people are going to need to manage the dams, that people are going to need to design the dams, that people are going to need to construct the dams. So there's the aspect of job creation. And there's also the benefit of creating clean energy through hydro power, well, at least in Lesotho, because of our terrain and we're a very mountainous country. So we just use the benefit of gravity to then as a byproduct generate electricity. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Yes, many times dams are even built for hydroelectricity. The purpose, the main purpose is to produce hydroelectricity. Um, anybody else? Okay. Yes, Sergeant. Yes, Sergeant. So please continue. Yes, I would like to say that one of the biggest negative impacts of the constructor uh, dam is the water availability uh, downstream for both environment and for the society to do their things for irrigation. So, I mean, Downstream, the water availability will reduce for both environment and for society. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, also you're very right there. Um, thank you very much. Somebody else, Bongani? Uh, hi, Trudy. Good morning, uh, hi. So um, I, I was once involved in a, a scoping statement that was being produced and the consultants had a negative impact for one of the dams. Um, I'd like to hear your comments on it. So on their negative impact was that the dam would provide water of poor drinking quality for the potential beneficiaries. And um, 
in your opinion, can that be viewed as a negative uh, impact? Or, or I, I just like to hear your, your, your opinions. Yes, thank you, Bungani. You know what? It really depends on the management of, um, because why would there be um, poor drinking water quality coming from the dam? Yes, we know um, with dams always, if we have wastewater that flows or effluence that flows into the rivers or into the dam itself, depending on how it's, the situation is, you do have nutrients that collect and can cause eutrophication and these types of things, but it all depends on how you manage. That's why the management and the monitoring um, of doing something like this. And again, that's why you do an EIA to actually look at what is the impacts. And if, the, if there's a consideration that you know that there is wastewater effluence going into the rivers that is um, running to this or the river specifically that is that this dam is being built on, then your mitigating factors, how do you prevent this? You start monitoring those and making sure there's a, a concept, uh, it's called TMDL that the Americans develop. It's like allocating basically um, a budget, a pollution budget to any specific um, effluent that is going into a river or a dam, downstream dam that might be on the specific river, that you manage it and that you monitor it. So it all depends on, there could be implications. That is so, but it, it depends on how you manage and monitor these things in terms of, of the quality of water that need to be treated eventually for drinking water purposes. Is that answering your question, Bongani? Uh, yes, yes, thank you so much, Trudy. Okay. Um, somebody else, please. We still need lots of negative impacts. <laughs> so I would like you to speak to me. We're learning from each other. As I said, the main Thanks, reason, Trudy. thank you. Ron, please continue. I my hand. <laughs> yes, I see there. Thank you, Ron. You can continue. Yeah. <laughs> the Kalito hand there. Yeah, so um, I think for me, one of the major negative impacts is um, <clears throat> the disturbance of the, um, I don't know whether I can call it the, the lifestyle of fish just block the path, you know, and I read from one place um, uh, to another. So really that is uh, one of the negative, one of the most negative uh, impacts, uh, exercise for large dams. Yes, yes, I agree with you. Um, thank you, Rowan, for that one. Felista, please continue, Felista. Okay, yes, hi, Trudy. Hi. One of the major negative impacts of a dam project is the displacement of the surrounding communities or rather the resettlement. The people who will be living around the area where this dam will be constructed, they will have to be resettled to another area. And by doing this, they will leave behind a, a lot of things they are attached they are attached to such as such as graves of their late forefathers so i think that one is a negative thank impact. you Felista. thank you for that francisco uh, yes thank you trudy uh i would like to stress about the the situation of reduced amount of water for downstream users and and, uh, and the environment itself. This is not a straightforward negative impact. So what dams does is to reduce peaks and lows, providing water in stabilized level for mm -hmm. all year round. So what yes. I could 
we could say is that some flooding is reduced by, by them. That, that affects some, some, some ecosystem that depend on the flooding. For instance, the wetlands. That's a, a sensitive ecosystem that can be affected by dams in downstream environment. But yes. saying that the water it will be reduced by dam, it's not a straightforward uh, statement because what uh, what we what we want when we build a dam is to make water more available during the most yes. of the year for our different uh, activities. So that's uh, yes. my contribution for now. Thank you. Okay, so it's in terms of water security. We make sure that we have water available all year round and not just during the rainy season, that you have higher flows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Brett, you can continue. Okay, good day. Uh, the, uh, the disadvantage that I have is um, the, build, the building of dams may lead to soil erosion. And when soil erosion occurs, there is uh, a disadvantage of leaching of soil nutrients from the areas surrounding the place where the dam is. And there is also a chance of sediment buildup in the dam. So when this happens, that means that the carrying capacity of the dam actually reduces. And like you mentioned earlier, because of the nutrients, there is eutrophication of these reservoirs. Uh, and these nutrients that get into the reservoirs lead to aquatic life being disturbed. Uh, some of them are actually poisonous to aquatic life. And then in the issue of sedimentation, that means that the dam will not actually serve its purpose because dams are actually used to reduce issues of flooding and other things. But in this case, because its carrying capacity is reducing over the years, that means that there are chances that this dam is actually a risk. And another disadvantage is actually the high cost and the risk that is involved in the building of dams. It depends on the countries, but in other countries, you realize that dams are built where there is seismic activity and, and all that. That means that those dams are actually bound to cause catastrophes when an event like an earthquake happens. So that's all that I have. Okay, thank you very much, Brett. That was a good, um, in terms of sentiment built up that you mentioned, do we have a mitigating factor for that with dams? Can you maybe just think about it and share if you have any experience with that? Yeah, okay. So when it comes to sedimentation, there are different ways that they use. Uh, what I've heard of is what they call dredging. Uh, they do what is called dredging, whereby they remove some of the sediments from the rivers using mechanical equipment, but it's expensive and it's not as environmental friendly as it's supposed to be. It only serves the purpose of reducing the sediments from the river. Thank you, Brett, thank you. That, um, yes, I have a comment here before we continue, dams harvest water for use during dry seasons. They also reduce downstream flooding. Effective routine dam management is critical to reduce adverse effects, yes. Um, Badana, please continue. Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, I also want to point out some negative impacts of dams. Um, I want to talk about the fact that dams uh, or development of the dams affect the natural functioning of the river. Um, I once did a study in my undergraduate uh, uh, studies where we were looking at the impact of uh, dam construction. Um, so what we did there, we have data for um, river flows or discharge for before the dam construction or before the dam was constructed. And we also have data for after the dam was constructed. So we were looking at how the, that dam had impacted um, the natural functioning of the river. And from that study, it was confirmed that indeed uh, dams do affect the natural functioning of the river. 
So um, in some instances, you find that the frequency of the flows or the timing or the magnitude itself, um, it won't be the same uh, as it was before the dam was constructed. Um, and also what that does is it affects the habitat because um, certain habitats are adapted to certain environment. So now when you have um, higher magnitude than you used to have before, um, that leads to loss of ecosystems um, and stuff like that. Yeah, so basically I just wanted to point out that um, construction of a dam affects the natural functioning of the river. Um, and also I wanted to talk about uh, the flooding. I, 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 I had a lot of people mentioning that dams can reduce flooding. Um, and that is true, but also I want to point out that it is not always the case. Um, in some instances, we see that uh, we can see that dams are actually prone to flooding because the way they operate the dams, um, if it's dry seasons, they open, they, I mean, they close the dams. Then if it's uh, wet or rainy seasons, they open those dams. So you can have conditions whereby um, the dams are overflowing and also it's raining and then that can lead to flooding also to neighboring communities or to the surrounding environment. So I just wanted to point out that fact as well um, in terms of flooding. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Badana. Moyo, you can continue. Moyo, you can continue. Hello. We, we are hear. the negative. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other negative impact of uh, dam construction is that it changes the landscape of the environment in terms of the ecosystem. And this might create game corridors and exacerbate the problem of human to wildlife conflict with the neighboring or surrounding communities. Uh, as a mitigatory factor, what can be done is if there are conservancies or protected areas within the vicinity of the dam area, there is need also to provide alternative water sources so that the game is not attracted to the water in the dam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moyo, for that. Um, somebody else that would like to continue? on the positive, negative, and we started to do even some mitigation factors on some of the, the negative impacts. If not, then I would like to go to the next question, which is related to how do we encourage public participation when we're doing an EIA for a dam, new dam development, especially when it's in a rural area? How do we encourage public participation. Uh, Trudy, I think I will just start, uh, even though I didn't raise my hand. Uh, I, I think that uh, we, can, um, we can encourage public participation by uh, sort of um, sharing information on the benefits of um, that project, because often people don't understand um, why is this dam built? How am I going to benefit? Because you, you, you know, we have cases even here in South Africa where a dam is built, but it does not really benefit the nearby communities. Uh, the water is taken and it benefits people that are far, people from towns, people who can actually pay. So I think uh, we can begin by looking at how the neighboring communities are going to benefit and um, relay that information to them and tell them the benefits so that they can then be involved, uh, knowing that there's something that they can benefit from that project. Thank you. Okay, and how would you share that? How would you share it with them, especially if it's a rural area, Vandana? How would you share um, I'm, it? I'm also from a rural area here in South Africa. So normally we, we, we have meetings at the Royal House. Um, um, you have someone who goes around the, the villages um, telling people to come uh, at a certain day or certain time, but also you can have notices that are pasted around um, on boards um, in public places where most people go buy bread and stuff. So you have those uh, notices where you're telling people to come to, to a meeting 
Uh, and in, in, in villages, we know mostly that uh, there's a certain specific day where we have our meetings, mostly here where I stay, it's Sundays. So um, it won't be something new. It's just, it will be uh, for a different project or a different topic, but really um, um, you can do that by just uh, putting a word out, raising, um, I mean, putting out notices. Yeah, just telling people to tell other people, you know, because it's in the village, word spread around. Anyone from the village can attest to that. <laughs> okay, do you think social media plays a role or not? In the, in yeah, the... yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. Thank you for that. I, I believe that it plays a role. And nowadays, I think technology has to be integrated in everything because almost everyone or in a family, you find there are people who are on social media. So I do believe that. Um, that also oh. is a platform that we can use. Thank you very much, Dana. Uh, I, I have one comment here that I just want to read. Public participation can be encouraged if the communities are told that the dam belongs to them and they, they are the owners of it. Um, Moya, you can continue. Thank you. Okay, uh, here in Zimbabwe, what we do um, to enhance public participation for big projects such as dam construction, um, the, there is usually a consultant that is, um, that is uh, given the job to do the environmental impact assessment on behalf of the proponent, whoever is constructing the dam. Um, they go down to the community through the institutional frameworks and uh, that already exists in, in the village communities. Usually we have the word assemble uh, which is chaired by the specific ward councillor and uh, comprising of the villages within the area. So they make a community entry meeting with the community leaders and meet the rest of the, uh, the villagers and they give their input with regards to the project. And then in terms of the technical um, nitty gritties of the project, these are reviewed at the at district framework where they are technical uh, experts we are for each and every area. Is it a social expert, a health expert, an engineering expert? We then go on further to interrogate the mitigations or the scope of the works that are being proposed by a proponent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Moya Brett. You can continue. Okay, so to encourage public participation, um, the most important thing is making sure that the public understands that this is their project because I've, I've went to a certain project once and we started doing our surveys and all that. And the villagers actually came out and they were saying, what are you guys doing? We are not happy about what you're doing. We were lucky because we had gone to see the chief first. So when they saw that we, we were with some of the chief's people, they were okay with it. So th the main aspect for you to actually reduce problems with the public for them to participate. I think the most important aspect we have to look into is making sure that they know about the project from the ground up. Even when you're proposing the project, before you actually say, okay, we have approved this project, now let's go and, and uh, convince the people that they need this project. I think that part should be done before you even approve of it so that the people feel like they are part of the project because they are the major stakeholders in this project. So whatever you're going to do, I think the most important aspect is making sure that these people are given enough information, be it you hold workshops, be it you go there in person and you talk to them, they should be involved in the process. You should tell them all the information that they need and you should give them a chance to ask questions, a chance to give you their own contributions. Once you do that, they know they are part of the project. You will never have any problems with them. Thank you very much, Brett, for that. Do you think it's possible that public participation can um, have a project not go forward and be stopped if you have proper public um, participation? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, some of these projects um, are politically motivated to an extent. 
So it depends on the area. But I think the public actually have a certain level of power depending on who they are and where they are from. So I think that the public can actually stop a project if there are people who actually decide that, okay, we are going to protest and say that this project will not go on. Maybe they will not ultimately stop the project from going on, but I think that they will actually deter the progress of the project. And you might actually have a standstill for a while if the public is against a project going further. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Greg. Innocent, thank you very much. Hi, Trudy. So um, I just wanted to say that I think Brett kind of like touched on what I was talking about in terms of um, the quality of these public engagements. Uh, I think the, um, the lesser the people know and the lesser that they're informed, uh, you know, it makes it very difficult. In most cases, probably not as productive as you'd want them to be if people don't know um, a lot, you know, maybe not a lot, but just the basics in terms of the importance of such infrastructures for their own economical projects and their own, you know, agricultural projects as well. So I think we we also probably need even as engineers um, to try and advocate for conversations, even when there are no them construction projects are happening at the moment. Maybe because of financial constraints in different places. I think there should be conversations just around educating the public about the importance of these infrastructures. That even eventually when there is a there's a project happening. Uh, we are not starting from zero to educate people and to talk to them about you know the importance of these infrastructures and how they as a public or as a, as the you know as the people they own these things so i think we we need to find a way of of, of making sure that we, we we at least have a foundation laid uh, so that when the consultations happen in the future they are happening with at least a public that is a bit more informed um to, to a certain extent so i don't know how that can be achieved uh, because I still feel like even after weeks of consultations, there may not be enough if we are trying to do away with a lifetime of ignorance and not uh, exposure to these yeah, critical issues. So I don't know how that can be done, but, but I feel like they, they, there's a need there uh, if you're going to have sincere, honest and quality engagements with, uh, with stakeholders. Yes, um, thank you, Innocent. And if we want to be sustainable, um, yes, we definitely. Kenosi, you can continue. Kenosi, you can continue. Okay, while we're waiting for that response, um, I have some comments here. Public participation should be encouraged in every project without any political interfe interference. Yes, please continue. Okay, I was saying maybe to add on to what other colleagues have alluded on. We had one, one problem of this public and community participation and there, there was an argument, if I can, I can put it that way, in 2012 um, in Botswana when we were building one of the biggest dam here. Uh, Maybe to, 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 to give a short summary of what happened. There, there, there was a construction of this bigger dam, the Hakron Dam in Botswana. And some of the community felt that they were, they were not being uh, told about it. And one lady, he lost his husband due to, to some of the, the things. Then she refused. The, the grave to be moved to where the demo was supposed to be there. And you know, it took a whole year for the dam to be constructed because she had her own social beliefs. And so what, what I'm, trying, I'm trying to say is if the community is being involved, they, they should be knowing that that's their project, they should own it. And if they are not owning that, there won't be development in, 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 in such areas. A dam is a big development source of water and other stuff. So if the community is being involved, taking time, discussions, quicker meetings and all stuff. So I don't think 
they won't there will be any problems or any delays on the dam construction. So public participation is a, it's a very huge impact and it should, should be taken serious. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kunosi. I'm just going to read one more chat just as backup to what Moyo said. Using local government setups can be really useful in promoting public participation and even enhances project ownership by communities. Um, it is important to use chief village administra administrators and council of elders, CBO leadership to reach the community. Um, also, this should be done before actual stakeholder engagement is done. It's just a uh, Bongani, you can continue and so after that, and then I think we'll wrap up the dam and we'll quickly go to the highway. Um, Bongani, thank you. Okay, hi. So um, in my experience, I'd just like to compare with the other uh, participants. What we have seen work best for us is where a community, be it a village or what, participates in a community visioning. This is where they, they draw up their aspirations or, or possible projects that can occur in their area. And one of the activities that occurs in that process is that is a participatory GIS mapping of their village or ward or district. And usually we superimpose this participatory GIS map with our GIS maps and we find out possibly if our dam site is at a ritual area or our dam site is at an important wetland for them. So that's the first starting point before we undertake uh, such projects and we usually find it to be the best. Although it takes a bit of a while to get the project actually start because it's, it takes a long time for the communities to to for the buy-in, for the participatory mapping, for the community discussions. But once they are on board, there are no problems after. Thank you very much, Pongani. So you can continue. Um, I'd also like to agree with most of my colleagues, but I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we're all human beings and we've all got an element of being social beings. So. I think it's important that public participation has to take place in a manner where people feel respected, valued, and recognized, where they don't feel like they're being bulldozed, where they feel like their opinions really matter. And we're just doing it, we're not just doing it to fulfill requirements, not just that because it was necessary for us to carry out a public participation aspect and we tick the box and then we move forward. No, we should really value and consider their opinions. Because in addition to that, I also feel like locals have a lot of indigenous knowledge that's very valuable. And you tend to find that in the construction of things like dams, the locals are the ones who even help us to identify maybe sometimes certain species of plants and animals. They're the ones who have a lot of historical knowledge about the place and they have a lot more to offer. It, lastly, it's also important that we water down our terminologies. We use a language that they can understand so that it's easy for them to assimilate and fully be on board without using big words so that they, they grasp the importance and the relevance of what is about to take place. And once that has been done, and if it's done properly, then we should not have any opposition. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for those important uh, comments. So um, in terms of really making things clear to the community or to whoever you are, transferring this information about this project so that they are clear about um, the project and what its implications are. Um, I think now we would like to continue. I would like to continue to the construction of a highway or a motorway, uh, following now the same process that we've just been to, just another project. So we do you think we require a full EIA for a motorway or a highway development and then also positive negative impacts? And when you have a, a negative impact, maybe even mention some mitigation measures already. 
Thank you very much. Can we have some response in terms of do we need the full EIA for a highway or motorway, motorway development? I just want to read one chat here. Furthermore, whoever does public consultation should uh, be conversant with the local languages and cultures of the jurisdictional area so that traditional rights um, for the project are performed. For the project are performed, uh, this enhances successful implementation of project without hindrances. Um, yes, we are now on the highway or motorway. Do you think we need a full EIA with that? Such a development? Any responses? Okay, Innocent, thank you very much. Please continue. Yeah, um, so I think with the motorway, uh, I think here now, um, I think this is where it applies to say the size of it matters, um, the size of the project. Was I, I felt like with the with different from the dam project, water is you know it's integrated, you know it's connected somehow. So there is need really to be careful with that. But I guess when you are putting up motorways, depending on the size of that project. Uh, then that's when you might need to do an environmental assessment project. But I, I feel like since we are with this trend moving towards, you know, sustaining, I mean, um, uh, environmentally friendly infrastructure development um, approaches, I feel like you still, the most I do think would be to prioritize uh, in EIA, but uh, practically I feel like in this particular case, the size of the project would matter. Uh, so that at least you can also reduce costs. It's, it doesn't really make does it really make sense maybe to do a, you know, an EIA for for a project that's not probably as big and has obviously a foreseeable uh, less impact environmental impact. So I feel in this case you might not necessarily need to do one depending on the size of the project. Okay, thank you very much, Innocent. Uh, Buni, Buni, you. You can continue. Good side. Okay, uh, I wanted to say I think it's 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 relevant for 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 an EIA to be done, considering that uh, there are a number of uh, points where road networks will actually intersect with uh, river river networks. So it's relevant for us if I, I believe the last speaker what they said was the extent of the project uh, determines uh the need for for an eia or not but i feel it's relevant as long as you're going to come across culverts bridges and any pathway where water would be moving it needs to to have an impact assessment because failure to do that means that all the water that is coming from uh all the water that is coming from upstream may fail to cross downstream because of the introduction of that road network or that road or that highway so meaning that you have a significant impact, either issues of uh, flooding in areas which were not uh, previously uh, flooding areas. And this may have an impact on communities around the road that will be done. So I think it's necessary because like what we're saying, an EIA is basically an impact assessment. So what is the impact of putting up that highway uh, on areas where water was crossing uh, where the road is supposed to be? Thank you. Thank you very good, Zai. You did mention, where are you from? Um, from Zimbabwe. Okay, thank you very much. Good time. Somebody you. else that want to say something? I just want to throw something in the in the pot. Uh, with roads, highways, storm water. What do you think? Groundwater contamination. What do you think? Um, do you think an EIA is needed in terms of um, the development of a highway or a motorway? Yes, Magari. Yes, please continue, Badana. Okay, uh, thank you, Trudy. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just. Uh, I'm not so sure. It's, I got it from one of the adways in town. Okay, Bunu, could I can you quickly mute yourself, please? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. That 
I didn't hear that's what you said. Could you just mute? It sounded like you were speaking to somebody else. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Thank oh, okay. you. Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, I wanted to talk about um, how in South Africa, uh, how we go about um, uh, determining whether the project uh, requires full EIA or just basic assessment. Um, so we have um, what we call listing notices. Um, so we have listing notices one, listing notices two and three. So um, what that uh, contain is that um, before you commence a project, um, you, 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 you have to appoint um, like an environmental representative um, who will be advising you on all environmental related matters. So um, like currently, as I mentioned before that I'm doing an internship uh, with a certain consulting company. So when we appointed what we do for a project, uh, the first thing that we do is we look at the, the project itself. What is it? What is it that they want to do? So in the case that you've given us, for instance, if we're saying um, construction of a highway, then we go to the listing notices and then we check if it, um, if it, can, if it falls uh, in listing notices one um, or two or three. So that sort of inform the decision on whether for that project we're going to do full EIA um, or we're just going to do basic um, assessment. Um, so um, in most cases, um, what also inform uh, us to do a basic assessment is the size of the project, um, um, the impact of that project and also the location. I, I can also concur to what my other colleagues mentioned here. Uh, that you will find that uh, road, not, road networks also um, sort of uh, mixes with uh, rivers and all that culverts and stuff. So basically the location of that highway will also play a role for, for, for us to determine if we're gonna do a basic assessment or if we're gonna do um, the full scoping and full EIA. Yeah, so that's how we do it here in SA. Thank you very much, Fadana. Thank you. Okay, um, can we move to the positive and negative impacts of uh, having to build a, a motorway? Could I? Would you like to say something? Yes. Uh... I think on the on the positive, uh, well, we 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 consider the the ability to 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 create linkages for communities, uh, allowing them to move uh, various products and so on. But I believe uh, one of the 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 the, the setbacks or the the negative impacts, uh, we then consider the impact that it has, which uh, I think one of the the speakers mentioned the the, the creation of corridors, whereby now we're now restricting maybe even movement of some animals that on the ecosystem side may actually have an impact. So I'm thinking uh, that's one of the, 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 the negative impacts that we may face with respect to, to, to highway creation. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. Good eye. Somebody else? Positive, negative impacts? Moyo, please continue. Okay, uh, thank you. Just to add on, on what Kudzai has said, um motorway construction is very important because it will commit it will connect communities from one community to the next even countries from one country to the other uh, for the movement of goods and services um access to critical essential services such as health care you can move from one town to another to access health because there is a proper road um However, the still negative impacts associated with motorway construction, such as um, they are a significant source of urban air pollution through exhaust emissions. And this can have a negative impact on health, on health and have health, health effects for people with uh, uh, preconditions such as asthma and so forth due to emissions of such compounds like carbon monoxide and such. Great, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohio. Very good, yes. Because there's gonna be a lot of vehicles moving, so you need to look at that. 
um, there will definitely be a lot of air pollution and what's the impact of that in terms of health. Very good, thank you very much. Badana, please continue. Uh, I just wanted to point out the positive um, um, in terms of job creation as with any project. Um, um, I believe that a lot of people um, will get uh, employment opportunities if a project like this were to okay. So I wanted to point that out as a positive. But also I wanted to uh, point out the negative impact, which I believe there will be a lot of uh, waste producted, uh, produced. Um, you have a lot of soil that will be eroded. Um, and if that is not properly managed, it can end up going to um, rivers and uh, damaging ecosystems there. So yeah, I wanted to point out that other negative impact, um, we also have um, noise pollution. We also have dust that can be um, generated during construction as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Padana. Somebody else on positive and negative effects? Do you think, Africa, I'll be with you just now. Do you think the way that we've been building highways and roads with uh, asphalt and all these, is this the most environmental way of doing highways or doing roads? Or is there other ways of doing it? Just, just think about that, Alfred. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, this is Alfred from Kenya. And uh, about a few positive impacts. There would be increased regional trade since these roads could connect several countries. Uh, in other case, there would be reduced cost of transport if they from other conventional if they are connecting other countries where there's no road and using air, the cost will be reduced. There would also be emergence of new towns and markets. And some of the negative negative impacts I could find as, 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 as that, there would be contamination of soil by fuel, oil spill, and lubricants used by the running machines and in construction of roads. There will also be disturbance of wildlife in cases where the road will cut a life, wildlife conservancy. There will also be disruption of businesses. See, if, if the planned road constructed is going through, through a town, and there is also the problem of acquiring land where the, the machinery will be, where the, where, where the road is to be constructed us. Yes, just that. Okay, thank you very much, Alfred. D. On that um, specific point in terms of wildlife and movement of animals, um, I think that's definitely something that needs to be considered, especially if you think about the highway, the Kalahari Highway that was built through Botswana from Namibia to South Africa. Um, there's a lot of not just wildlife, but even cows, so domestic type of um, normal farming animals that you find along the road because um, they, yeah, there was accidents happening with some of the, the cars and the animals on the road. So that's some of the things. And how do we mitigate these things? What's, what's some of the mitigation things that we can do? to prevent things like that, for instance. Can you talk to me? Budai, please continue, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I think one of the mitigation measures that have been implemented uh, in Zimbabwe has been the introduction of uh, fencing uh, the, the, the length of the road. This has mainly been done. We've got a road that was uh, recently finished that is uh, between Harare and Blawayo. And it was mandated that the, 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 the contracting companies, they were supposed to put a fence along the, 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 the road. That's because Harare Blawayo, especially after Gweru, 
uh, that area is known for, for, for cattle rearing. So there will be a lot of cattle that will be moving in the, in the road. So coming back to the point that you've mentioned in Botswana, I think that was also something that, that was happening in Zimbabwe whereby a lot of accidents were happening because of cattle finding their way onto the roads. So I feel that's one thing uh, as a mitigation measure that needs to be implemented, that it is part of what the contracting companies will need to do. Apart from just doing the road, they also need to fence the area to prevent movement of animals in between, even though they'll need to put gates in between to allow for, for crossing, uh, be it for the animals or even people in that particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kudzai, for that. Thank you. Um, Anybody else on positive, negative impacts or some mitigation factors? On a highway development? In terms of the air pollution, can I ask, um, what would you think the negative impacts, how, would we, how can we mitigate the negative impacts related to air pollution, the vehicles that, what is some of the things we can do in terms of mitigation? Anybody? Nobody's okay, got well, any. Uh, hello. Yes, Afri, the, please continue. Uh, okay, for to mitigate for, uh, on dust pollution, I think water, water, sprinkling water on dry dusty surfaces should be done regularly. Uh, Oh, it's also installing of dust nets around the batching plants can help a lot in reducing the dust. Okay, and in terms of the air pollution, the vehicles afterwards, what do you think is some mitigation factors in terms of the exhaust gases coming from the cars that would be driving this road? Uh, they should ensure the machines and vehicles are properly uh, maintained and regularly maintained. Um, mitigation measures, I would say, what would you do to prevent exhaust fumes? Uh, okay. Yes, Alfred, please continue. Yes. Okay, I'm saying for air pollution, the, the machines and the vehicles could be, should be properly and regularly maintained and serviced. Okay, thank you. Innocent, please continue. Yeah, so as a mitigation measure uh, in terms of the pollution, I think you need to have a careful land use planning, um, maybe, and also just an issue of uh, planting more trees. Um, yeah, so, so I, I guess maybe that probably will be the most uh, realizable uh, mitigation measure that we can, we can, we can employ. Uh, and also, I think there's an issue, I think what they're trying to do in Zimbabwe is to try and uh, you know, reduce uh, in the number of uh, vehicles, uh, old vehicles, so old model vehicles obviously have high emission um, yeah, you know, levels as compared to the recent model. So they've been trying to phase out those type of vehicles. But I think the most practical one will probably to do a reforestation uh, of some sort and a careful land use planning uh, that, that, that to see more trees being planted and more crops and things like that, just to try and absorb all of these or to try and counter uh the air pollution yes thank you very much innocent i'm just going to read it in the chat also here air pollution can be prevented by dense vegetation along roads using less carbon emitting fuels very correct improve engine efficiency and removing unroadworthy vehicles on the road thank you very much for that bongani please continue uh, hi i've got a question can noise pollution be considered as a negative uh, determinant? Absolutely, when it's, especially when it's close to neighborhoods um, along the road. So yes, Pongani, it could be. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Because I, I, I think I, I stay just next to a highway and I think noise is a major, major disturbance. So I mean, what 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 happens, or what 
what can be done in such situations where a road passes through a community or a village or, oh yeah. Yes, thank you for that question because it was going to be Kenosi. It's gonna be, it was going to be my next one. So what do you guys think in terms of noise pollution? What is the mitigating factors? Kenosi? Okay, maybe to, to, to add on air pollution issues. And I think the, as the country, they should encourage people to use public transport instead of everyone using his hair or his or her own car every time going for work. If there are five cars in the road, then if you use one public transport, it's, you have reduced five other emitting cars. So I think that's, that's one of the best way to encourage the, the other use of, or the other way of reducing uh, air pollution. Even noise pollution, I think that one can also work. Yes, thank you very much. Kenosi, please continue. Kenosi, please continue. No, I, th I think I'm done. I was, I was just going to, to load on that one. Okay, um, thank you very it. much. So, so you can continue. Oh yes, um, I was going to suggest a mitigation um, a mitigation measure for um, time. I mean, noise. What you can do is that you can have your heavy duty vehicles travel, legislate for them to be traveling at a certain route within certain time frames or give them an alternative route altogether that isn't next to communities because the heavy duty vehicles are much more noisy compared to your smaller vehicles. And in other countries, what they do is that they cap the speed such that when a certain car passes within a neighboring, within a neighborhood, um, it's slower because when it's slower, it only doesn't pose a threat to maybe killing more people by way of crashing them, unfortunately, but it also is more silent, so it doesn't make much noise. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, So that's right. Uh, Kalisto, please continue. Can you tell us where you're from also? Thank you, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Okay, it's Kalisto from Mozambique. Uh, I'm sorry for my English, but uh, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Uh, the, the issue of noise, I think it's not only for people, but also for animals. So we need to take care of this noise uh, next to the village, but also where the animals are. So for me, the, the, the measure that we can have to mitigate this is to, 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 to reroute our, our, uh, our motorway uh, far, on those uh, locations. And if that is not possible, uh, we need to put some sound barriers for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalistu. Um, so, and Kenosi, do you still want to say something? No, I, I think- No, sorry. Um, I'm okay, thank you. Oh, sorry, but I can add maybe a road Another problem that it may cause the lights of the cars usually lead a lot of road to a lot of roadkill because animals are usually attracted to the lights, especially at night. Yes, thank you very much for that comment. Okay, then our last um, part is how do we encourage public participation in this case? What do you think? Kalisto? Okay, uh, Kenosi, do you want to add something in terms of that? Yes, Kalisto? I'm sorry, I forgot to, 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 to put down my, my hand. Okay, Innocent, please continue. Thank you, Kalisto. Yeah, um, so I'm, I'm quite a strong advocate uh, for, I think, engineers or, I mean, designers of infrastructure 
um, going in extra effort, doing, going extra mile in structuring their, uh, their, their, their community involvement uh, in terms of saying that we don't wait until we have a, a project, uh, you know, for us to do the public engagements uh, that are necessary, because you'll be starting from way, you know, you'll be starting from behind so much. Um, and I feel like what has been done in Zimbabwe, making, um, you know, uh, highway knowledge, I mean, available even from primary stage where, where you're told how to cross roads, what I think we should probably then also advocate for a way that then uh, helps us to have uh, conversations of such infrastructures happening from, from that stage as well, so that we don't only have uh, responsible road users, but we also have responsible individuals in terms of them playing a key role as stakeholders. So I think at the moment, um, I think that could go a long way in terms of just being intentional uh, in, in also influencing uh, maybe curriculum and also just influencing uh, you know, the, the understanding before a project even happens. So making it more like something that's part of our community, something that's part of our conversations. When you look at a road, we should be able to know the decision process that has gone, uh, you know, in, into establishing that road. I think it should not be something that should be far or distant from the community. It should be something that's just... Um, yeah, so, so I feel for in terms of community engagements, that, that that's the approach I probably would would um, obviously long term approach and not um, an immediate one. But I feel like that's probably what we might need to start working towards. Thank you very much, Innocent Bay, uh, Badana. Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, I also wanted to point out um, another way on how we can involve the public. Um, uh, I think through newspaper adverts as well, that is also another platform that we can use to send out the message uh, before we even commence the project as my other, um, as other participants have been mentioning here that it's important for people to know and to be involved uh, before you actually commence with the construction or with the project itself. So um, yeah, I also just wanna uh, speak from my experience here um, where I'm working that um, before a project comments, we, we, we have a notice, um, we approach a, a news, uh, newspaper and we, we, we sort of advertise um, a notice so that people who are affected and also those who are interested because um, we don't have to uh, involve only the affected parties, uh, but also those who are just interested in a project, uh, we have to involve them. So um, using a platform like a newspaper advert, you can be able to reach um, 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 a greater uh, magnitude um, if you do it that way. So yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, newspaper adverts is also another way that we can use to reach out to interested and um, affected parties uh, for a project. Yeah. Thank you very much, Padana, for that. I just want to read a comment before I go to break. Another negative impact of motorways uh, uh, increased rate of road traffic accidents, especially if it's within neighborhoods, uh, mitigation measures that might include imposing speed limits. Um, I just want you to also think about, uh, like I said, the materials that we use for the road. If we introduce, for instance, the famous plastics, it's been done in certain countries overseas, plastics being introduced with the asphalt. Um, so we need to think out of the box. Um, also, with our cars, um, the material that is used for tires, the engines, like some of you have mentioned already, um, in terms of the air pollution, but also the noise. Um, and then I would like to continue. Now, Brett, please continue. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, in the case of public participation, I think it is important for us as the ones who are designing all these projects to actually go on the ground and get knowledge about the people, learn about their social skills, their cultural skills and all that, because it is important to know that a resistance doesn't necessarily come from a point of people saying, uh, this is not good for the environment. Sometimes it comes from cultural beliefs and their traditions. So if you get the knowledge to know that, okay, 
this certain tree is uh, regarded as uh, sacred in this place. So you know that when you are designing your road to reduce conflicts, you should know that, okay, this place, this place, etc., is important to these people. It holds cultural value to them so that you don't disrespect them. Once you know that kind of information about the people, and by knowing that information, actually, that means that you actually become one with the people. You actually get to embrace them and be with them. So you will not face a lot of resistance when you are actually doing your projects because you are doing them in line with what they believe in and with what they want. I think that is an important aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brett. I think with that, um, I would just like to ask, when, you, when do you consider an EIA has been successfully implemented? When would you consider an EIA has been successful in its, in its purpose? Brett, do you still want to say something about that? Okay, Moyo. Okay, uh, thank you. I would consider a, a successful EIA as an one that is uh, well focused on the project impacts and also enhances um, the positive impacts of a project and there's a clear uh, procedure and framework on addressing um, the negative impact and also anticipate other problems because the EIA is not an all-inclusive document. It can never be exhaustive. Some of the project impacts will only be felt once the project is being implemented. Hence, the, um, the EIA should be not be rigid. It should be flexible to incorporate other impacts that will happen as the project is being implemented and also have plans to mitigate uh, such problems. And also a successful EIA is one that um, enhances the participation of all stakeholders who are involved in the implementation of the project. That's the proponent, uh, the users of the, the asset that is put in the communities and the stakeholder and the government within that jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you, Moyo. Thank you very much for that. Etni, can you tell us where you're from also? Okay, uh, my name is Edni Mukavel. I'm from Mozambique. Uh, sorry for the English. I don't know if you can understand me perfectly, but I will try so. Um, but in my point of view, I think that uh, we can consider that an uh, EIA was successful implemented with, firstly, if the EIA uh, was uh, prepared or elaborate in conform with the legislation, uh, the, the environmental legislation at all, even if you can consider the legislation of the country, the local country, or uh, other legislation uh, environmental from other country. Well, I think firstly, um, is that we can consider. Uh, second, we can consider the responsibility of the owner of the project. If he can, can consider all the programs, all the impacts, all the measures are considered by the study, and if he is a, if the owner, I implement all of them. Well, I think that, that uh, the two things or the two aspects, uh, it's relevant to consider that the EIA was implemented successfully or not. Thank you very much, Edney. Badana? Uh, thank you, Trudy. Um, I think for me, I, I, I believe that an EIA was successful. Um, if it does not only focus on the water, land and air um, aspect, but if it was inclusive of the social, cultural, um, um, historical um, aspect, and also the economic aspect as well. 
So if it looked at all the, the impacts and if it looked at the impacts uh, on all those aspects and try to minimize or where possible to prevent um, negative impacts, um, I, I believe that it would have been um, successful. Uh, but also uh, we, we will find that sometimes you have alternatives um, um, where you have two options. Um, one where maybe it will benefit um, um, the economy more, uh, but also have more uh, negative impact on people. So really um, with EIA, it, it, it's very difficult sometimes to say when you have really successfully implemented it, but I will just leave it um, at saying that if we inclusive and trying to not gain on one end, but trying to balance the spectrum, I think uh, that way we would have successfully implemented it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patana. You uh, added a very nice um, side to this, to end this off. Um, students, it's been a very interesting learning journey for all of us, I believe. Um, I would just mention, as we went through the two discussions that we've had, the two um, examples, the, the new dam development and the highway, uh, we have gone through all the notes, basically indirectly by just discussing. So when you go to the presentation and the official notes that was loaded, you will see, um, yeah, starting with what is an EIA. Secondly, what is the, what's the, I think that specific uh, slideshow ends with what is the final goal in terms of an EIA. It's normally either a report or a statement, but even after that, we've mentioned some of the, um, the monitoring that needs to happen afterwards and that you discover some things only after the project has been implemented. So it starts with screening, it starts with, uh, follows with scope, the impacts uh, identification, the mitigation, the report, the review. So all the steps, the monitoring, all the steps that is, is part of the whole EIA process. Uh, we've covered it all indirectly with the discussion. And I want to thank you for participating um, in this session. It didn't feel like two hours to me. Normally you would be exhausted uh, as a lecturer if you've been speaking for two hours. So this is the nice thing about online learning. And I have really enjoyed the session with you. Um, tomorrow morning, we would quickly do the the um, few quiz questions. So go through the slides, please. And then um, we've even discussed the public participation. I left that out now with all the things that I've mentioned. Um, very important part of the whole EIA journey. Um, so, and thank you very much, uh, Badana, for mentioning it's not just about water, land, and air, it's about the social, the cultural, the historical, the economic and all these aspects I can mention. In Namibia, there's been a hydropower station that hasn't taken off. It hasn't been implemented for many years where there is a waterfall Ipupa because the local people refuse that they should develop a hydropower station there. So public participation can actually stop a project from going forward because the people need to be moved from where, where they currently are and the implications in terms of their lifestyle, et cetera, et cetera. So this is part of EIA and this is what it's all about. Um, so thank you very much. And I'll see you tomorrow morning for a brief 10, 15 minutes before my colleague, um, Dr. Joshua from the Malawi University will take over with the case studies. Um, I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your participation. Is there anybody that would like to say something still? Anybody? If not, I would like to greet you. Um, yeah, it was, I have a comment here from Bungani, very insightful, thank you, Trudy. Thank you very much, Bungani. I enjoyed it just as much as you did. <laughs> so thank you very much.
Anybody else? Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you so, yes. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Bye, Calisto. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Trudy. Thank you, Barana. Welcome. Innocent, thank you. Thanks, Rowan, also. And Alfred for participating. Thank you. Edney, Kanasi. Uh, sorry, Trudy. Hi. Uh, yes, yes, I wanted. To, I wanted to ask one more thing: uh, whether NAST is offering any research master's programs around this topic, uh, around this particular area we're covering here. Um, you're talking now about EIA and SEA and so on, or yes. are you talking about integrated water resources? Uh, I'm talking about uh, the EIA. Um, unfortunately, not in our department because uh, I'm with civil and environmental engineering. Okay. Uh, but I'm sure there is in the sciences, the applied sciences. Oh. And these people specialize the um, specifically. We have a master's in integrated water resources management. But okay. as I said, it covers now. It covers this also, but it also covers it. It's more covering different aspects like wastewater management water management it covers a lot of different things but briefly ah okay um and then you also have a thesis afterwards okay. i was busy writing to you we have only a, um, a master's integrated water resources management and then we have a master's in environmental engineering and ah. then we we have a master's in civil engineering currently and um, Nasty is busy with the PhD part also on, on integrated water resources management. Ah, no, thank you so much, Trudy. Have a, have a good one. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for participating. It was great. <laughs>